thank you everyone. Uh, I want to extend a thank you to Alicio and Renata and all of the Epitrack team for making this a uh, fantastic event. You know, a lot of work goes into organizing it, uh, so I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to give a talk on OMG. Where are all the disease prediction models? I uh, would go with the uh, theme of the, uh, of the panel and, uh, and go into it. And it turns out, um, let's see, um, there's not that many, but uh, that's probably not a surprise. Um, there you go. Okay, so um, before I begin, I would like to share with you where um, I work. So I'm part of the U.S. National Laboratory System. There's actually 17 national laboratories, uh, and I work at one of them called Pacific Northwest National Lab. And we're in the very northwest, or the, the top left of the U.S., um, in Washington State. All right, uh, we do all kinds of research at the lab. Uh, we do biofuels, battery development, um, proteomics, uh, and I work in data analytics. Uh, my background is in data science and in computational epidemiology. Um, and it's a fun place to work. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a review that we conducted um, over biosurveillance models, uh, which is a tiny bit more general than an infectious disease model, um, and then talk about uh, some of the findings of that review when we looked at true prediction models uh, and kind of differentiate the difference between maybe a forecast uh, and a prediction. All right, so things that, you know, models can help answer all kinds of questions. Uh, so how would we know if there's a problem? Um, and, you know, more importantly, that, you know, the, the theme of this panel is will there be a problem? Uh, can we predict uh, a model? And, and if we do, what can those uh, models? Um, I'm not sure why it's uh, that that little thing is there, but basically, we, we went in and we wanted to do a review of the literature to say what all models are out there. And we made a really general discussion um, or our definition of models that included evidence of conditions. So these are your traditional models that we heard earlier as well as some things like evidence of risk. So if there was um, economic um, motivation for adultery and food, so these are more risk-based models, um, and all of those were in included. Uh, and I also believe that Onicio made these slides available on Lanyard, so if you'd like to download them afterwards or through the conference website, uh, you are um, uh, more than welcome to. So what is a biosurveillance model? Um, and again, this was by the team that did this review. This is how we defined it. It's not the end-all, be-all answer, but it's just how we defined it. Um, it could be proactive or anticipatory, so meaning used to detect a disease or uh, to forecast. Um, it could be asset to assess risk, or it could be descriptive in nature and tell us something about the disease. Uh, so all of these are, are important factors that a model can help us um, answer. So here's some examples of them, and they'll go across the board from human diseases, animal and zoonotic diseases, to plant and food models. Uh, and so in this review that we did, we definitely included all of these. So a One Health approach um, to the inclusion of the data that we looked at. So before we went in and tried to evaluate these models, um, so this might look familiar to Jen up here, because she was actually participated in a workshop we had at PNL many years ago to evaluate um, this was event-based biosurveillance systems and kind of come up with characteristics of things that are important that went beyond um, some initial work from the US CDC on evaluating disease surveillance systems. Uh, and so we came up with some interesting characteristics, the papers there. Uh, read it. Um, so next, back to the review that we conducted. Uh, we queried all kinds of databases and um, Google searches. So we, conduct, we collected 13,000 citations and a team of interns, bless their hearts, um, actually went through and reviewed them uh, along with a subject matter expert um, to identify um, these type of models. And these are example keywords that we used. So it's a disease forecast, infectious disease model, remote sensing, so anything with satellite imagery, 
spatial disease model, infected borne disease model, et cetera. Uh, and so this is just a selection of the type of things that we looked for within this review. Uh, and at the bottom right, CBRN refers to chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. Okay, um, that may be a little bit hard to read, but this is called a, a PRISMA flowchart. It's what is required whenever you do a systematic review on how you actually down-selected the literature that you reviewed. Uh, so at the very top, we started off with our you know, tens of thousands of citations. Uh, and each step, we had a review of the articles um, until we came down to um, a, the selection of articles that we wanted to review um, in detail for our paper. Uh, we also, we, in this paper, we actually narrowed it down a little bit more because there were quite a few. And we narrowed it to, a, to the list of select agents. Um, in the U.S. at that time, which are things um, that are notifiable diseases um, and, and a little bit broader. Um, so in the end, we actually found 44 papers uh, that, we, that we reviewed in detail. Um, some were excluded because they dealt solely with like, human immunology. Um, they didn't um, focus on disease detection or, or forecasting um, uh, and, and so on. All right, so I apologize, I'm lazy, so I copied the table, and so the citation numbers in there, they won't mean anything. Um, but you can go to the paper and, and find out what citations those refer to. Uh, so we categorize these based on the type of model they are. So dynamical models are those that give a description of the processes of disease spread or what have you. It includes SIR models, probabilistic ODE models, etc. Um, event detection, so these are the event-based biosurveillance systems. So these actually will detect an event or a model that uses some type of open data or, or a surveillance system. Uh, event prediction, we made a very specific definition of event prediction. Uh, event prediction here is something that happens before the disease occurs. Um, and then we also said a forecast is once that disease occurs, can you forecast the spread of the movement. Um, so there's very few models that actually are that can you predict a pandemic um, before there's an index case. Uh, and so you see here that there's actually, we saw four models that did this um, and, and quite well in, in some cases. Um, risk assessments are those that um, may involve some type of remote sensing or some other type of integration of data. And then spatial models are those that only look at um, the spread over um, a geographic area, or there may be um, some spatial statistics, or um, um, use maybe a plume model, or to see how the, the dispersion of, of uh, a disease would spread over an area. Uh, so just for reference, kind of the, the different categorization of transmission. By and large, uh, the models we looked at dealt with direct transmission, but definitely vector-borne. Um, and we separated vector-borne from arthropods um, and waterborne and soilborne um, from each other. And a couple of non-specific diseases as well. What's interesting is looking at the data that was used to build these models. Um, and so this is how we categorized the data that was used to um, create them. So if they used epidemiological data, so by and large, papers did do them. If they use um, sources from a government or an NGO, um, the literature all the way down through expert opinions um, to epidemiolo epidemiological data from a different location. So using some other data to train your model that you then want to um, build later on. Um, and then also simulated data and so forth. So this gave us an idea of you know, what are people using out there now for data. And if you look at this slide, you should think, well, I know other data sources that, can belong, that maybe could help these models to make better predictions or better forecasts. And so this is a busy slide. Uh, so this, this goes beyond um, data sources and now looks at variables that are used within the models themselves. So you can, you can see all kinds of um, uses of them. Uh, the work that I do primarily nowadays deals with social media analytics. Um, and you can see down here, if you look, it's the third from the bottom. Um, very few of the models actually um, even include just social, cultural, behavioral factors within them. 
So prayer schedules, how people pray, do they hold hands at dinner? Um, do they um, have other practices that um, affect um, how a disease can spread? Uh, and then you can you know, cross-correlate the types of, of, of models that, that um, were in um, that, that were in those in that data type. So the last thing we did was say, could we use this in an operational environment, or could we use this to actually make a decision? It was maybe the best way to, to say this. And so we looked at how the models were verified and validated. Um, and so V and B is the, the is what we call it. Um, and it was interesting, uh, only a very few of them weren't validated or verified at all. So if you ever read a paper that wasn't validated or verified, um, just throw it out because um, it, it probably won't tell you very much. And then there's different layers of B and B. Um, you can have statistical verification, which deals with area under the curve or um, descriptive statistics. You have sensitivity analysis all the way to being validated with spatially and temporally independent data. So using a different, even a different disease or a different location at a different time uh, to validate your model. Uh, and, a, and a couple of the models uh, did that well. Um, so it's a, it was a really interesting process to see that there, if there are, you know, yes, OMG, um, there actually aren't many disease prediction models, even though a lot of people have worked um, very hard uh, on the problem. Uh, and so here's kind of some opportunities for, for us as modelers or as a community. Um, and so I think there's a, a need to train the next generation of epidemiologists to use predictive models uh, and algorithms um, or, or work with people that know how to do this. Um, so a lot of models and systems don't interoperate and don't talk with each other. Um, so that's just, you know, that's kind of a, uh, definitely takes a community to help solve. Um, and there's very few models that uh, forecast what we call evidence of, um, that don't just do correlations. So there's, there's models like with Rift Valley Fever that do a really good job of saying, I, I liken it to a forest fire. Um, risk. You know that if you put a match into a very dry forest, um, it will combust and the fire will spread. However, when is that match going to get there um, is the question. Um, and then there's very few models that involve new types of data. So social media, participatory surveillance data, how can we build on what has gone before and add it with what, we've, um, what is there today. Uh, and so here's a couple of citations for novel data sources that I think are kind of cool that have come out very recently. Um, one, there's two that are on restaurant reservations and Wikipedia edits. Um, and there's another one that looks more of a, um, as a, as a non-proliferation exercise. So it was published in Science Diplomacy, uh, looking at, looked at social media analytics and web analytics across a variety of diseases. Um, by a gentleman named um, Maynard Halliday. That's a really interesting paper. Um, and kind of my passion is social media, so um, this, this second to last one, Behavior Surrounding the Drug Wars in the Americas, it won a Best Paper Award. It's not related to disease, but it's, it just shows what kind of interesting findings one can find out of, um, out of the data. Um, and it showed kind of desensitization of the narcotics drug trade in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, and the last one's by a paper by one of my colleagues that shows that um, your friends are more interesting than you are, um, and that you have more friends than you do, and it's called a network paradox. Um, and so how can we leverage principles like that into epidemiological modeling uh, is of interest. All right, so uh, there's my contact info at the very bottom. I'm on Twitter as well. <laughs>